I want us to pray um, from, from Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, and then we will pray again from Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And you say, well, why are we praying this? Because we need grace. Because we need the Spirit of God to open up the eyes of our understanding. Because we need that insight, that revelation from the Spirit of God. So that we do not operate like mere mortal men. So that we do not walk according to the natural. But rather, that we might see through the very mind of Christ. So, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray right now that, Lord, that our love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that we would be so rooted in this nature of Christ that is in us that that's what's going to emanate out of us, that we may approve and choose those things that are excellent, that we would be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, and that we will be ever increasing in the fruits of righteousness, the manifestation and the evidence of that indwelling life that we have, which is the very life of Christ. And Father, I pray from Colossians chapter 1, by the Spirit of God, that you would fill us, everyone underneath the sound of my voice, that is tuned in to this broadcast or listening to this message that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and in all spiritual understanding so that we might walk worthy of the Lord, that we might walk upright in the reality of the truth, that it is Christ within us, the hope of glory, and that we would be ever so fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen us with might according to your glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joy, that we would abound in thanksgiving, giving thanks to you, Father, who has qualified us and, make us and made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. The blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ, has qualified us. Thank you, Father. We give you praise and glory and honor. And I thank you, Lord, now for the freedom and for the liberty of the Holy Spirit that this word would go forth and it would not be hindered and it would accomplish all that you purpose in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Glory. Hallelujah. And in this message today, I want to talk about and minister along the line of biblical meditation and just the very essence of that so that you and I might be more effective in renewing our mind and training our born-again spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says, for those who live after, who live according to the flesh, they set their minds and they set their thinking on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things, they set their mind and their thinking on the things of the spirit. Now Colossians is going to say, set your affections on those things which are above, not on the things which are beneath. And then it goes on to say, Romans 8, verse 6, because, why is that? To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The mind of the flesh, which is sense and reasoning without the Holy Spirit, is death. It's separation. It's separation from God. It's death, which compromises all of the, the miseries that are arise from sin that arise as a result of the fall. But the mind of the Holy Spirit, the mind of the born-again spirit, hooked up with the Spirit of God, is life and is peace, both now and forevermore. 
Why is that? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. It's not subject to the mind of Christ. Nor indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now here's the good news. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. If you are born again, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. You live in the spirit. And because you live in the spirit, you need to walk after the spirit. If any man, man does not have the spirit of Christ, then he is none of his. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So if you're born again, you are in the spirit. But you've got to learn how to walk in the spirit and to walk after the spirit. And the key to walking in the spirit, walking after the spirit, is to get your mind renewed and to get your, 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 your mind renewed and to get your spirit trained and developed and become more proficient in its functioning. Amen? It is of absolute importance that you renew your mind. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what is God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. So, to get your mind renewed, to, to, to renew your mind, you need to be, so that you could become sensitive. Sensitive to what is happening in your born again spirit. Sensitive to who your born again spirit is, his nature. Sensitive and be in agreement with his position. Galatians 5.16 says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because you see, your spirit is in harmony with the spirit of God. And as you walk after the spirit, as you become renewed in your mind, and as your spirit becomes more skillful, more proficient in his operation, and what he does, then what will happen is that you will come into that place you will, where you will prove and experience God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. What am I talking about when, I'm, when, when we say about your spirit man becoming more proficient in its operation. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 says, even though the outward man perish, yet the inner man, your spirit man, he is renewed day by day. Your natural mind, you see, your, your natural mind, your, the, the natural mind, the mind, your, your soul has not been saved. The natural mind has been programmed with information that comes from your experiences, that comes from your past, information that comes from your culture, information that comes from your body and your physical senses. But you're born again and all those old things have passed away. Now this new man has been created after the image of him that created him. After the knowledge of Christ. So what happens is if you do not renew your mind to the new man and to the knowledge of God and to the word of God, then what happens is you're not going to be able to experience the reality of knowing and proving God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. Now, when we talk about renewing of the mind, we're talking about, uh, just to use some computer language, it's like wiping out the old program and putting in the new program. Putting in a new program that is according to truth. Putting in a new program that is according to the word of God. Putting in a new program that is according to the new man, who he is, his position, how he functions. Putting in a new program that is according to what Christ has finished. That is according to the sacrifice. And unless we do, then what happened again, we will not prove and experience what's God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. Instead, what will happen? Your born-again spirit is filled with the life of God, is blessed with every spiritual blessing, has the very righteousness of God, has the kingdom of God dwelling on the inside, has divine healing and health and wholeness inside of your born-again spirit. But if the mind is not renewed, what happens? That life in your spirit, you're not able to draw it out. 
You know how it says in Philippians 2, 2 and verse 12, draw out your salvation with fear and trembling? Then you're not able to do that. Um, Isaiah 12 and verse 3 says that um, with, with, with joy do we draw from the wells of salvation. The, the, the wells, the, there's all kinds of deliverance and wholeness and prosperity and healing in your spirit. But yet, even though that is the case, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, you could be alienated from that life because of the ignorance, because of hardness of heart. Amen? So it is imperative that we get the mind renewed so that we can have the word of God and the promises of God fulfilled in our lives and so that we can walk in the nature of Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Quite frankly, if the mind is not renewed, because you see, the mind and the soul is what lies between the, the spirit and the body. And when the mind is not renewed, when the soul is not restored, what happens is the body will not cooperate. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, I buffet my body so I could bring it into subjection and and if I could borrow another scripture and bring it into the obedience of Christ. But to bring your body into that place is not going to happen without your mind being renewed. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to emphasize the absolute importance for you and I to have our minds renewed. Glory to God. Because if we don't, and the body is still ruling, then we live as baby Christians. We live in a place of carnality. We live in a place where we're dominated by the circumstances, by the flesh, by the environment. Instead of being in a place where we are more than conquerors. Being in a place where we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. So, the will of God and the purposes of God for your life is, is simply this. You see, before God saved you, before you were, uh, Second Corinthians, Second Peter chapter 1 verse 9 says that God has saved you and he has called you according to his own purpose. And it's not according to your works. It's not according to your culture. It's not according to your background. It's not according to your, to your intellect. But he has saved you and he has called you according to to his own purpose, which he had purposed in Christ and, a, and has given you grace so that that purpose could be fulfilled. But that only happens as Christ in you is unveiled and, it, and appears. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 and 10. So again, if that life of Christ is not made manifest, if you're not functioning in that life and in that nature of Christ, then the very purposes of God, the call of God, what God has spoken concerning you, and the grace that is available for you to bring those things to pass will be, will be short-circuited, will be even aborted. So it is so important that you and I must become renewed in our mind, become sensitive to the operations of our spirit and for our spirit man to become more trained and more developed and more proficient in his functionality. Hallelujah. Why? So that the promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ might be fulfilled. The promises are yes and amen, but it's in Christ. It is as you function in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. Now we can operate on a low level of Christianity. Uh, um, but, but I believe we are in a time where God is calling us to come up higher. I believe we are in a time where God is saying, I need you to be my mouthpiece. I need you to be my arms. I need you to be my feet. I need you to be the very manifestation of my life. I need you to be so that as Jesus is, so am I in this world. That's how I need you to be. So that when they see you, they see me. Amen? So it is necessary for me to provoke you. Provoke you by revelation. Provoke you by the Spirit of God to come up higher. Get your mind renewed. Become more sensitive to your born-again spirit. And take the actions and, and, and the diligence that is necessary to make your calling and election sure. And rise up in your spirit so that your spirit man can become more proficient and more skillful in functioning as who he is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You say, well, why is this important? Why is it important that your soul 
should be renewed. Your soul should be restored. Your mind would be renewed. Because, you're, because you see again, here, here is your spirit, here is your body. Now if your soul and your mind is renewed, then between your mind, your soul being renewed and your mind being renewed, and your spirit, they will cause your body to follow. Your soul will side with your spirit. But if it's not renewed, it will side with your body. And what will happen? Flesh will dominate. Amen? There is a law. Romans chapter 7 verse 22 and 23 says, There is the law of God. Your spirit man delights in the law of God. Your spirit man delights in the law of God. But there is a different law working in your body. The law of sin and death that wants to take you in the way of sin, that wants to take you in the pathway of separation with God. And here is your soul standing right in the middle. Now, when your mind is renewed, then that law of your mind will agree with the law of your spirit that delights in the law of God, and together they will cause they will cause you not to walk after the flesh, not to walk after the, the law of sin and death that is functional in your body. And what will happen? You will all come in harmony and the will of God shall be done and you will be sanctified holy in your whole spirit, soul, and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? All right. So you must develop and also, you must also develop and be sensitive to what your spirit is doing, what your spirit is saying. You must become more sensitive to what your spirit knows, what your spirit is perceiving, who your spirit is, his nature, his position. And if we are not sensitive to what's happening into your spirit, you see, it says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, that the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord. And then in Psalms 18, verse 28, that God will light your candle and enlighten, and enlighten your darkness. You see, if you can walk after your spirit, then you will walk in the light. You will walk in the pathways that God has prepared for you. Psalms 85, verse 13, you will walk in the spirit. You wouldn't be missing God. But then if you don't, what happened? When you, if you don't, then what, if you don't to be, be sensitive to what's happening in your spirit, then what will happen is that you're going to end up missing the witness of your spirit. You're going to end up missing the voice of your spirit. You will end up missing the leading of your spirit, which will cause you to miss God. And to miss God is to be snared by the enemy. To miss God is to stumble. To miss God is to even possibly end up in a place of ruin, according to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 14. So this is a serious matter. Amen? But I declare you're not missing God. I declare your mind is being renewed. I declare your, your, your spirit man, you're becoming so sensitive to your born-again spirit, and you are so training your born-again spirit to become more, more, more robust and more proficient in it's functionality that you are not going to miss God. But all that God has for you shall be fulfilled in your life. Amen? And you are going to be the blessing and the manifestation of the life of God in this earth that God has designed and foreordained for you to be. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. All right. Now. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying three things here. I'm saying one, you need to get your mind renewed. And I'm saying, secondly, you need to become more sensitive to what's happening in his spirit. And I'm saying, thirdly, that your born-again spirit needs to grow and become increasingly proficient in its operations. We talked about some of that last week. So that your spirit would be like a, would be like a strong muscle rather than a weak muscle. A strong muscle that is able to execute the will of God the will of your spirit over the soul and over the body and make them come into subjection and make them come into the obedience of the life of Christ that is in you. Amen? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, so there are six keys by which you are able to renew your mind, become more sensitive to your born-again spirit and its operation, 
and to you to be able to train your spirit to become more skillful in its operations and its functioning. Here are those six keys. Number one, meditating in God's word. Number two, praying in tongues. Number three, having a prayer life that is in pursuit of God, that seeks after God. And because of that desire to seek after God, it is also good to mix fasting with your prayer. Number four, to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer, doing what the word of God says. Number five, letting the word of God have be final authority in any situation and on any subject. And number six, staying pure. Staying pure in your conscience. Developing in the grace of trusting the voice of your spirit. Amen? All right. So those are the six keys. Now, we're not going to go through all six of them in this, in, in, this, in, in this time of study. But what I will do is that we're going to focus for the rest of this message on meditating on God's word. Biblical meditation. Amen? All right. Now, it is very important for you to grasp this because we talk about meditating in the Word. But quite often, a lot of believers don't really know how to. How do you meditate in the Word of God? We know God says to Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you might observe to, to, that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. Then you will have success. In Psalms 1 and verse 2 it says, um, um, well it says, verse 1, Blessed is the man that delighteth. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his pleasure, his focus, his joy, his rejoicing is in the law of the Lord, which is the word of God. And in his law, that's in the word, he meditates day and night. He, that man, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. He is planted by the rivers of water. So even though there might be dryness in the land and the land might be parched and the land might be having a drought, he is planted by the rivers of water and he has got a supply. And he will bring forth fruit in its season and his leaf shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. We're talking about meditating. Now, Lord, now some of those scriptures, you, you know, you probably do know. But we got to focus. We got to go beyond those scriptures. We got to find out, well, how do I meditate? And then we got to do it. Amen? So let's talk about it a bit. Meditating, biblical meditation, that's meditating on the Word of God, is a process by which you ponder and by which you interact with the Word of God. And you interact with that word in various ways. Speaking, muttering it, singing it, envisioning it, imagining it, memorizing it. Means by which you interact with the various, in various ways with the word of God until the truth and the life that is in the word is literally released into you. Until the truth that that word, that that word declares becomes revealed to you, becomes real to you, and becomes your experience in your spirit. I, I, I like to think of it this way. Biblical meditation is, 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 is a vehicle that God has given unto us to make spiritual things real to us. You know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, the lights are off and you stump your toe, you know, again, some bad posts. Man, that hurts. That pain is a physical reality. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a, and you have a nightmare, so to speak, 
In the midst of that nightmare, man, it feels ever so real. That's a soulish reality. Well, similarly, the Word of God, God has, God has given us meditation so that you can get a hold of the Word of God, and as you meditate on that Word and squeeze the life of that word, out of that word, into your born again spirit, then it becomes real. It becomes so real that what anyone else, what the circumstances say, what people say, what the doctors say, what anyone else says is not what is your final authority. It's not what matters, but what happened. His report is the final report. You believe his report as opposed to any report that is contrary. So revelation, so meditating on the word of God is to bring you to that experiential, that place of the experience of the word of God where you know that you know that you know that you know. Now I wish we could do that with every verse of scripture. But I don't know if we're going to be here on the earth long enough. <laughs> Right? And that's why so we're going to have to choose certain verses of Scripture as the Spirit of the Lord leads you that you can meditate on and come to that place. Uh, for me, there are a couple of things. For me, uh, the issue of, um, of, 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 of John 14, 26, for instance, that the Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will teach you all things, lead you and guide you into all truth, he, and, 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 he will, and he will bring all things to your remembrance. That is, because, that is real to me. The fact that the Holy Spirit is his job, it is his assignment, he is the one that brings things to my remembrance. Amen? Whatever he has said unto me. It's also very real to me that there is nothing hid that shall not be revealed, nothing covered that shall not be uncovered. So if I'm missing my keys or there's something I can't find, I have a confident expectation that I'm going to find it. First of all, God knows where it is. It hasn't disintegrated, but I have a word. And it's real. Nothing hid. Whatever that thing is, is that is hid that might be covered shall not be remain covered. It's going to be uncovered. And I expect to find it in the name of Jesus. So I can declare and I can decree that. Then I could go start searching and I'm going to find it. Why? Because that's real to me. The reality of the righteousness of God. I'm being in right standing with God. And because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I stand in his presence, holy, without blemish, uh, without reproach. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. He was made to be sent for me, that I am made the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, in the presence of God, it is as if sin has never been. So, whatever has happened in the past cannot bring condemnation on me. Whatever someone says or thinks or whatever cannot bring condemnation on me. Why? Because the reality and the revelation of righteousness is real to me. It's my experience. Does it mean that I don't ever mess up? Sure I do. But I'm able, should I, I'm able to get up, receive the blood, purge my conscience from every dead work, and go on with God and not enter into some place of, on, of, of, of separation from him. What am I saying? I am saying that meditation will squeeze the life and the truth out of the word of God and, and, and cause it to become engrafted on the inside of you. Meditating is like a cow. A cow takes that green grass, <laughs> chews it, swallows it, regurgitates it, brings it back up, chews it again, and goes through that process. And, then, and, 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 and that, whole, that process of chewing this grass, chewing this grass, over and over, that is a process of meditation. Now, I think it's kind of curious that, the, that that green grass becomes white milk. I don't know how that works. But the power of meditation. It is like, putting a, it's like having a stone that, with some rough edges and placing it underneath a waterfall. Where the, where the waterfall is, is just going on and on and on. After a period of time, that, small, that stone becomes very smooth. And especially on the area where the waterfall is falling. So that's what it is to meditate. It's to get a hold of the word of God. Stay with that word of God. Interact with that word of God. Squeeze the life out of that word of God. Until it becomes imparted on the inside of you. Amen. It is having that intimate intercourse. That intimate participation with the word of God. So that it's life can come out of it. So that you can have the wisdom that is in that word. So that you can have the power. You can have the truth. 
James in one James one twenty one says, "Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul." So it causes that word to become engrafted in you. John chapter fifteen verse seventeen says, "If you abide in me and my word abides or lives in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you." So that meditating causes the word to abide, to become an abiding word, to live on inside of you, to become one with you. Think about that. And you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Could it be that one of the reasons why many prayers aren't answered is because we're praying it because the word says so, but we're not praying it from the place where that word and that truth and that promise is real to us. It is not abiding in us. And because it's not abiding in us, when it looks like it's not working, guess what? We faint. And we don't stay with the word. Because you see, it's true faith and patience that you obtain the promises. True faith and staying in faith that you receive the fulfillment of whatever the word of God has promised. And when the word is not abiding in you and is not engrafted in you and you haven't meditated in that word and you don't have a revelation in that word, then it's hard to stay with that word and to stay with that promise when the pressure comes, when the contradictions are there, when it looks like it's not working. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. What am I saying? I'm simply trying to give you an understanding of what it means to meditate in the word and I believe God that you're going to also have the motivation to do so. So, how then do you meditate in God's word? Which is to say, how then do you interact with the word of God in various ways so as to squeeze the life that is in the word, that is in the seed of God's word, out of it into you? Amen? First of all, I say follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to start with. Now, choose scriptures and choose, choose scriptures or, 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 or topics that you're interested in or that the Spirit of God is leading you in that you need to, that you need to, um, that, that, that you're pursuing. Find scriptures that relate to that subject, relate to that topic. Maybe it might be, maybe it might be in the area of, of your marriage. Maybe it might be in the area of, um, maybe you may have a, 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 a problem with some kind of bondage. Or you may have a problem with, with anger. Or maybe you just need to be able to, to function and operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Well, find the scriptures that, or maybe it might be financing. It might be healing. Find scriptures that relate to that subject that you are interested in, that you are pursuing, or that the Holy Spirit is leading you to, and then get those verses of Scripture and meditate in it. Choose those Scriptures. Amen? All right. And I can suggest so many areas of meditation. I believe that there's a couple of things that, need, that are foundational. Having a, having a revelation of righteousness. Having a revelation of what Jesus has finished having a revelation of what Jesus did with you in his sacrifice. Because you see, everything that Jesus did with you in his sacrifice is how he wants to be in you and through you. Jesus wants to be in you as if you crucified. Jesus wants to live inside of you where the old man has been buried. Jesus wants to be inside of you with the reality that you've been raised up and ascended. You've been resurrected with him. And furthermore, you ascended with him and sit at his right hand. Jesus wants the application of his life that is in you to, to be real. Jesus wants the application of his blood that's been shed on your behalf and the forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins and this new covenant that you're in to be real. Jesus wants the, um, the, the authority of his name to be real. Jesus wants the great and precious promises and his utterance, what he's speaking in you and through you to be real. Jesus wants to be functional in you in various aspects because of what he did in his sacrifice, in his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, his shed blood, his life, his name, and his promises and, his, and what he's saying in you right now, his word, glory to God. So those are some areas that you should be meditating in. You should be meditating in Galatians 2.20. Where it says that you've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer you that live, but it's Christ that liveth in you. And the reason it is so is not because of your works. But it's because of Jesus, that Jesus died. Hallelujah. And rose again. 
right? So, but specifically, there are various, you, you choose what areas you need to be meditating on and let the Holy Spirit guide you and then go to work. Amen? How do you meditate? Read, study, study, study the scriptures, study the scriptures. Don't be casual about it. Be diligent. Be diligent. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 12 says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give attention. There's meditation right there. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift of God, the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate, meditate, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely, abandon yourself to them, that your progress may appear and may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine and continue. There's a meditation word, continue. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's meditation, continuing, staying with our word, continuing them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You see, when you meditate and you stay with the word of God, and the word begin to produce in your life, you are going to have manifestation of the fulfillment of the promises. But not only will you have manifestation, but once you have manifestation, your manifestation and testimony can now be reproduced in someone else. So that now your manifestation is for multiplication. So the profiting is not only unto you, but it is also, it is, but it is not only do you save yourself, but those who hear you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You get a testimony of healing, man, you can duplicate that somewhere else. You know, I remember in my own life, I remember the difficulty. I had such difficulty being baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with our other tongues. Amen. And I, I did everything. I fasted, I prayed, I memorized all the scriptures, and I did all of that. And it was rough. And I can remember pleading with God, and I said, God, if you ever teach me, if you ever, once, once I get filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm, gonna ask, I'm asking you to teach me in such a manner that I can help other people get filled with the Holy Ghost, and they don't have to go through all the agony that I did. And thank God he answered that prayer. I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and today I find it very easy to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, of course, I'm not the one filling them. It's God that is filling them with the Holy Ghost. But I find it relatively easy. And not only that, but my wife has the same testimony. She gets people filled with the Holy Ghost easy as well. My daughter, same thing, gets people filled with the Holy Ghost on the phone and, and in various places and, and, and so on. Why? Because my experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost was not just for me. It is to be duplicated. So your testimony, your victory, your salvation is to be multiplied, is for multiplication. It is to be increased. That is how this kingdom of God works. That is how this gospel is spread. That is how we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is how we make disciples of all men. You are to be discipled and then you disciple others. Glory to God. So meditating in the word of God, observing to do according to what it says, brings you into such a place and gives you a testimony and gives you fruit that you can now duplicate. I'm going to come to this later, but let me mention this right here. One, the thing about meditation is that meditation will produce revelation. And then when you get revelation, then you will have the motivation. And when you have motivation, then you will take action. And then when you take action, that's when you get fruit. And that fruit is a manifestation. And manifestation is for multiplication. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That sounds good anyway. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, blessed is a man that delighted in the Lord, delighted in the word of God, and meditates in the day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaves will not wither. Whatever he does will prosper. Hallelujah. So, 
we're talking about how do you meditate in the word. You got to read. You got to study. You got to spend time with the word. Read different versions. Read, any, read, read different versions of a, of a particular scripture. Make notes. And then go back and read your notes and meditate on your notes. Confess the word. Declare the word. God said to Joshua, here you are, Joshua. You got to lead these millions of people that, that um, are crossing into the promised land. And God says, I'm going to tell you how you can be successful. Don't let this book of the law depart out of your mind. Keep this word in your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Keeping the word in your mouth, speaking the word, that's a form of meditation. Don't let this word depart from your mouth, but meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. Do, do, that's a good word. Do, a, do, not try. That you would observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. But be of good courage and do it. In other words then, your success, as much as it is going to be because of the grace of God that produces it. Yet at the same time, your success is going to be because of the diligence. Because of your meditating, because of you observing to do the word, because of you having your mind renewed, amen, because of you presenting your body living sacrifice, there is a responsibility that you have before God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has invested in you. He's invested his spirit. He has shed his blood. He's given you his word and he expects a return. But that investment that he has given placed in you, the way you give him a return is by doing what his word, word says so that that life and testimony and what he's placed inside of you could come out of you and be multiplied in the lives of others. Amen? Glory to God. I gotta, I'm preaching a little bit. I need to stick to the teaching. <laughs> Read different versions. Make notes. Confess the word. Psalm 70 verse 4 says, I will, it says, um, if you love his salvation, say continually, let the Lord be magnified. They that love his salvation, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Say what the word of God say and keep on saying it. Just keep on saying it. Just keep on saying it. Keep on saying it. Say what the word of God says. He bore my sickness. He carried my infirmities. By his stripes I am healed. I were healed, I am. The, uh, the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead quickens my mortal body. His divine healing power is flowing in every cell, in every joint of my body. His divine healing power belongs to me. The same power is moving on the inside of me. It's moving in every organ. It's moving in every cell. It's moving in every joint. My God has commanded his blessing upon me and upon my storehouses. My God has declared that he blesses my water and he blesses my bread. He empowers everything that goes into my mouth to do me good. And he takes sicknesses away from the midst of me. Declare it. Speak it. Declare it. Speak it. When you start off, it might not be a revelation to you. It might be not just be words. But as you stay with it, man shall not live. Man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It will move from just being words to revelation. It's going to be moved from just the word that, is, that you read in this book called a Bible. And it's going to move to the place where... It is the word that God is speaking to you. And that word that he speaks to you, that word is spirit and is life. And you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. So confess the word. That's part of how you do this. That's part of how you meditate in the word. God commands meditation. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's a command. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Keep it in the midst of, get it in the midst of your heart. Keep it in your mouth. In, in um, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, and this is pretty good. It says, this is how it works. The word, that, it says, we have the more sure prophetic word. That word, we have the more sure word of prophecy. And you will do well. You will do well. You will do well. If you will take heed, stay with it as unto a light that shines into a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises up in your heart. 
Have you ever, sometimes you know you travel, you go somewhere, and you're staying in a hotel. It's not your house, it's a hotel. You're not familiar with it. And so, you know, you go to bed at night, and the lights are all off. But then in the middle of the night, you wake up. Maybe you want to go to the washroom or something. But when you wake up, you're, you're not home. You're in a hotel. And you're kind of thinking, well, where's the washroom? Is it over there? Is it over there? And you're just not sure. But then all of a sudden, a little bit of light comes in through the, through the, under the door or through some keyhole. And as you gaze at that light that comes in through that keyhole, all of a sudden it's as if the room gets bright. And all of a sudden you begin to become oriented. And you recognize, uh-huh, the washroom is over there. Well, so it is with the Word of God. You are to keep gazing at it and stay with it until that day, until it rises up in your heart and floods you with light. Glory to God. The Word is a lamp onto your feet and it is a light onto your path. The Word of God will give you directions. It will make your crooked places straight. It will show you where you need to walk. But that comes from meditating in the Word. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. So meditate in the word, speak the word, confess the word, do it aloud, do it under your breath, do it under your breath. I always like to say to people that one of the ways, be, even before the revelation of righteousness comes, just learn to go to bed at night. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. Wake up in the morning. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm righteous even as God is righteous. It is a gift. I am the righteousness of God. And then in the middle of the day, when condemnation, guilt, shame, or anything try to come and jump on you, just under your breath say, I'm the righteousness of God. Sometimes you're not able to do it in public. For us, folks might think you're weird. Right? <laughs> but what do you, but mutter, mutter the word on your bread. By his stripes I am healed. Thank you, Lord, for your divine healing power flowing in my body. By Jesus' stripes I am healed. The same spirit of raised of Christ and the dead quickens my mortal body. Your healing power is flowing in every joint, flowing in every cell. I am the heal of the Lord. Mutter it on your bread. That's part of meditating. Amen? Hallelujah. Another way you can meditate the word in the word of God, memorize the word. Psalms 119 verse 11 says, um, says, says um, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Meditate, memorize, memorize the word. Glory to God. Now, here's another thing that is important. You've got to have a right attitude to the word of God. Sometimes people are irreverent. They, I mean, they, they exalt their own opinion above the word of God. Well, yeah, I know the word of God says this, but this is what I think. Uh-uh, uh-uh. If you have that kind of attitude, the word of God is not going to produce much in your life. So you got to have the right attitude towards the word of God. Psalms 119, verse 161 says, My heart stands in awe of your word. In another place it says, I tremble at your word. Psalms 119, verse 15 and 16 says, I will meditate in your word, and I will going to have respect to your ways, and I will delight myself in your statues. I will delight myself in your word, and I will not forget your word. Hallelujah. Have the right attitude towards the word. Magnify it. Exalt it. God magnifies his word above all else. You must magnify his word above your opinion or the opinions of anyone else. And certainly above religious tradition. Jeremiah 15 verse 16 says, Thy words, God, your words were found. And I did eat them. I consumed them. And your word was to me joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 20, sorry, Job 23 verse 12 says, I have esteemed and I have treasured your words more than my necessary food. I have treasured your word. Your word is more important to me than my necessary food. Glory to God. I know there's a great man of God that raised several people from the dead that will not eat without reading the word before he eats. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs 13 verse 13 says, He who despises my word or thinks little of my word and doesn't respect and honor my word will be destroyed. Will be destroyed. Will come to ruin. Why is that? Who's here for verse 6, six and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge 
And then Hosea 4 verse 14 says that when the people don't have understanding, it will bring them to ruin. But why? Why? Why is that? Because of not having that respect and honor for the word of God so that the word can enlighten you. So that the word can, 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 can unveil itself to you, so to speak. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But then it goes on to say, he who fears the commandments will be rewarded. Psalms 112 verse 1 says, blessed is a man who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. Hallelujah. His seed shall be blessed. So, what am I talking about? Your attitude towards the word. Don't be high-minded. Don't be full of yourself. Romans 12 verse 3 says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Now, it doesn't mean that you're a worm. It doesn't mean you're a doormat because that scripture goes on to say to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You are to think right. You are to recognize that you are a son of God, that you are God's masterpiece created in his image. But don't be high-minded thinking that you are something that you are not, thinking that you are better than someone else. Don't, th don't think like that. Don't be high-minded to, to exalt your opinions above that of the word of God. But humble yourself. Submit yourself to who, to, to, to who he said he is. To who he says you are. Submit yourself to the truth. Don't be high-minded. Be humble. Be clothed with meekness. James 4 verse 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. In Psalms, I think it's Psalms 138, could be verse 8. He says he knows the proud are far off. In other words, there's something about pride that smells. You got to just hold it off there a bit. He gives grace. You see, it is the Spirit of God that teaches you, that leads you, that unveils to you, that reveals to you, that gives you revelation knowledge. But if you don't have the right attitude, you're not going to get it. So you need to humble yourself. Romans 3 verse 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. That includes yourself. Don't exalt your own opinion. Amen? And you know, sometimes we can have an attitude where, you know, where, 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 we, where we think we know everything in this particular scripture. No, 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 no. The Bible speaks about the length and the breadth and the depth and the height. Don't ever have the attitude that you know everything there is about some particular scripture or about some particular subject in the Bible. Always be open. Be open for more. Be, be, be desiring to come up higher. And another thing while we're at it, don't be lazy. <laughs> you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit might bring a scripture to your mind, and you might just think, or you're studying the Word of God, and you think, yeah, I know what that scripture says. And you feel too lazy to turn to it and read it. Well, don't do that. You may turn to it and read it, and it might jump right out of the page, and God might speak to you. Amen? Now, why is it important having the right attitude towards the Word of God? Let, 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 let me put it to you this way. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 30, a scripture we're familiar with, says the Word of God is alive. It's living. It's alive. And it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. I remember one time I, when, uh, um, one time I saw this, this analogy or I saw this picture of the Word of God being alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I thought about a fish in an aquarium. If you take that fish out of that aquarium or out of that, that little bowl, you take that fish out of that aquarium and you put it on a countertop, because the fish is alive, it will be bouncing and it will be moving all about. Well, the Word of God is like that. It's not dead. It is alive. But it is also sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing of the soul and spirit. It knows, and the joints and the marrow. It knows the thoughts of your spirit. It knows the thoughts of your mind. It penetrates the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it is a discerner. Which means it scrutinizes and examines the very thoughts and the very intents of your heart. And there is no creature... There is nothing that is hidden from its sight. It's alive. And it knows exactly where you're at. If you're disrespectful, it knows it. If you rejoice in the word, it knows it. If you don't highly esteem the word, the word of God that you are endeavoring to study knows where you're at. 
And if you don't cooperate with the word, don't expect the word of God to cooperate with you. The Bible says God is not mocked. Don't expect that this word of God is going to be unveiled to you and you're going to get revelation knowledge while despising or not holding the word in high esteem. Everything is naked and exposed and open to the eyes of the word of God to whom we must give an account. So that is why you need to respect the word. You need to have reverence for the word. You need to stand in awe before the word. Don't see it as just some words on the page. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was made flood. God and his word are one. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, there are some, let me just mention a few additional benefits, so to speak. Where the word of God is concerned. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13 says, Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Think like God. Think according to the word. And rest your hope fully. Have this hope. Have this expectation. And let it fully rest upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, when revelation comes, grace comes. Second Peter chapter 1 says, um, Grace and peace is multiplied to you at the knowledge of him. So when you get revelation knowledge, and if the word of God is unveiled to you, and the person of Christ that is in your born again spirit be, is unveiled to you, what happened? More grace comes. Because grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. So it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Think like God. Gird up the loins of your mind. How? By being sober. By thinking like God. How? Getting the word of God into your mind. And then as you do, guess what? Great revelation will come and the grace of God will show up. And when the grace of God shows up, you can go to another level. Amen? Hallelujah. So, meditation will bring revelation. And then when you have revelation, you are going to be motivated to do the right thing. The, the, areas, the areas where you have revelation, you can't do otherwise. I mean, for those of you who have revelation on, on the authority of your word, you cannot allow you, you no, I mean, it's almost impossible for you to talk, to, to say, oh, I'm dying to get there. Oh, this makes me sick. Oh, this bugs me. I am irritated by this, right? You know, I mean, nothing ever works for me. When you've got revelation of the authority of your words, you can't talk like that anymore. You are motivated to talk right. Well, it's, it works in other areas. When you get a revelation of Jesus being your divine health, you cannot help but expect to be free from sickness and disease. Amen? When you get revelation that you've been crucified with Christ and that everyone else has been crucified to you, then you are not going to be as affected by what other people do or think or say. And you will find it a lot easier to remit people's sins and not hold their trespasses against them. Why? Because you get a revelation that when you were crucified, that when Jesus was crucified, you were crucified with them and they were crucified with him. I'm only saying that to say this. Revelation, which comes from meditation, Revelation will produce meditation, will produce motivation. And then when you are motivated, bam, you could take action. You see, when you try to get people to do what you want them to do, but they don't have a revelation, it's not, it's not going to work. It wouldn't be sustained. But when you got motivation, when you got revelation, and you get motivation, then you can take action. And when you take action, that is when you can have fruit. That is when you can have manifestation. And then when you have manifestation and you can taste and see that the Lord is good, then you now have a testimony that can be duplicated in the life of somebody else. So now your manifestation is for multiplication. I'm going to repeat that. Meditation produces revelation. Revelation produces motivation. Motivation produces action. And then action produces manifestation or fruit. 
and, the, and your manifestation is for multiplication. That's the Christian life. What are some of these additional benefits of meditation? Meditation. It says in Psalms 119, verse 105, that the word of God is a lamp unto your feet, and it is a light unto your path. Psalms 119, verse 30 says, the entrance of the word give it light. It gives understanding to the simple. So the word of God, and when you meditate in the word, it will give you direction. It will help you to know what is your next step. What should you do next? You're not always going to, it would be wonderful to hear the voice of the Lord saying, do this or do that. But God will speak through his word. And sometimes you're going to just have to meditate in the word long enough so that you can hear what the spirit of the Lord is directing. So that you can have the directions that you need. Meditation will produce directions as well. Glory to God. And let me, let me, let me say, say something else. I like it anyway. It sounds good. Meditation will move you from information to revelation. Information to revelation. You can get information just by studying a dictionary. Right? But revelation comes from the Spirit of God. Proverbs chapter 6, reading from verse 20. 21, it said, verse 20, my son, keep your father's commandments and don't provoke and, and don't forsake the law of your mother. Stay with the word. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you roam, when you go back and forth, that word that you've been meditating on will lead you. When you go to sleep at night, they're going to keep you. And when you wake up, they will speak to you. When you be, I mean, how many times you've been meditating in the word and, you, and because of the word that is in you, you wake up in the morning and you hear that word. You hear that word speaking to you. Or you're about to do something that perhaps you shouldn't do and that word begins to speak to you. Amen? It might be simply walk in love. <laughs> but that word will speak. That word will, be, will, will direct you. That word will not just be information, but it will become revelation as you meditate in the Word of God. And the Word of God, meditating in the Word, will produce success. I, I mentioned before, Joshua 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your eyes, but you shall meditate therein, day and night, or shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein, day and night, that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. James chapter 1, verse 25, James 1, 25 says, that when a person looks into the perfect law, that's the word of God, of liberty, and continues in it, there is meditation, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in whatever he does. And again, Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove and experience and know what is God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. Now, here's a very interesting thing. Psalms 19, verse 7 and 8 says, The law of the Lord, that's the word of God, it's perfect, converting the soul. Psalms 23, verse 7, verse 3 says, He restores my soul. So the word of the Lord, God by His Spirit, will restore and convert your soul, and it makes wise the simple. The statues of the Lord, that's the word of the Lord. They are right, and they are the rejoicing of the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. What is that saying? It is basically saying that as you meditate in the word of God, it will bring joy and it will bring rejoicing. Do you need an extra bit of joy to walk in? Do you need some rejoicing in the midst of the storm, in the midst of whatever the enemy might be trying to do or say? Meditate in the word. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Meditating and 
Meditation and revelation will bring your, now here, listen to this, will bring your spirit, your soul, and your body into harmony and bring them on the same plane. Psalm 16 verse 7 and 9 says, I have set the Lord continually before me. He's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Now listen to this. Therefore, my soul, my soul, my heart, my soul is glad. And my glory, that's my inner self or my spirit man, rejoices. So my soul is glad. My spirit rejoices. And my body shall rest con confidently in safety. That's your spirit, soul, and bodily in harmony and in a place of, 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 of rest, in a place of peace, glory to God. That's the power of meditation. Meditation will also produce life and health. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22 says, verse 20, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Don't let them depart from your eyes, but keep them in the midst of your heart. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Think on it. Get it in the midst of your heart. Act on it because they are life to those that find them. You got to search. You got to meditate. You got to be diligent. You got to study to show yourself a proof. They are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. I'm going to read that again. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life. That's the life of God. To those who find them. And health to all their flesh. So meditation will produce life. And it will produce health. Glory to God. Now... Let me just give you some simple things that you can practice. Hallelujah. How much time do we have? Praise the Lord. Here are some things that you can practice. Number one, pray because you're looking for revelation. You're not just meditating for meditating's sake. You're meditating because you want to be intimate with God, because you want to know God. You want the word of God engrafted in you. So you need revelation. So pray the prayers, in, 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 um, the scriptural prayers. Pray Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 to 23, that prays that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The eyes of your understanding would be open, and that you would, be, uh, 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 and that you would come to the knowledge of him, etc., etc. Pray Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 20, that God would strengthen you by might in his spirit, by his spirit in your inner man, so that you can dwell in the love of God, so that you can know the love of God, so that you can know the nature of Christ, and that you might abound and grow and know the length and the breadth and the depth and the height and be filled with all of the fullness of God. Pray Colossians 1 verse 9 to 15, that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and in all spiritual understanding. Make that a practice. Do that constantly. Do that daily. Number two, meditate in the word while you sleep. You say, oh, can you do that? Well, if you put enough word in, it's going to bubble up while you sleep. While you sleep, it will keep you. Psalm 16 verse 7 says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I cannot tell you how many times I might be getting ready to prepare for, for a message that I might need to preach on Sunday or whatever the case is. And I might go to sleep at night not having the clarity of what exactly I'm to do. I might not even know what the message is. But during the night as I sleep, so many times as I'm sleeping, that word and that clarity, and it's like God begins to speak to me on the inside and things begin to bubble up. It says in, it says in Isaiah 50 verse 4, that morning by morning he wakened my ear to hear as I learned. I have learned to wake up in the morning and just check to see what's in your spirit. Check to see what's happening in your spirit. Check to see what, what has been deposited in there. See what it is that your spirit knows. Because quite often, you will get answers to situations even in the night when you sleep. So learn to, to do that. Learn to meditate. And, and, and when you're sleeping at night, roll the word of God around in your thinking. Psalm 63 verse 6 says, When I remember you in my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Hallelujah. 
Number three, we're talking about practices that would make if your, your meditation and, and, and revelations effective. Number three, read the word from a place of being attached, not detached. When you read about Peter saying, um, um, Jesus, get the, when you hear, when you hear P Peter saying to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, not so Jesus, you are not going to do this and da, 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 da. And then Jesus turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me. And then Jesus go on to tell him that, it, that if you want to be where I am, you got to learn to take up your cross and follow me. Don't let just, that just be a story about Peter. You need to get right in there and recognize what is he saying to you. That you need to take up your cross and you need to not allow that spirit of offense that causes you to look out for your own needs and your own reputation to, to possess you but rather to reckon yourself dead and indeed crucified and that it is the life of Christ that you're living inside of you. You read a verse of scripture. Let's take, um, what's his name? What's, let's take um, 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so are we in this world. Take it personally. Don't read it as some beautiful scripture. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. How is he? Well, that's how I am. You read that my meat, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of God. You think, oh, how wonderful. Jesus' says, meat is to do the will of God. That's what empowers him. That is what moves him. Well, you recognize that, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. The voice of your, your the essence of your born again spirit, the real you in the inside, he is saying the same thing. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Jesus is a body you've prepared for me. You need to take it personal. This is the body that he has prepared for me. Don't read the word of God as some storybook from a detached place. Learn and develop in reading the word from a place of being attached. Revelation will come to you in a greater measure as you do that. Amen? Hallelujah. Number four. And, and, and while I'm on that subject, before I leave that, you need to maintain a righteousness consciousness. You need to maintain a, a, a conscious awareness that you are one with God. Jesus is the head. You are his body. He is the vine. We are the branches. The same life in the vine is the same life in the branch. As he is, so am I in this world. Amen. You need to develop that conscious awareness of Christ being inside of you. You know, it is so annoying when you hear believers sometimes pray, oh God, please come. Oh Lord, come, come. It, you know, and I'm looking out for the presence of God. Don't, 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 don't talk like that. When you do that, you are denying the fact that he says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are making void the truth that he is on the inside of you. He abides in you, and you and him are one. You live in his presence, and his presence is in you. Acknowledge the presence of God. Acknowledge what is in you. That is how your faith grows. The communication of your faith becomes effective as you acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ. Okay, number four. We're talking about practices that will help you to become more effective in, in, in your meditation and in getting revelation. Number four. Don't ignore your spirit and its operation. What do I mean by that? If your spirit is, be aware of what some of his operations are. Do some studying, listen to last week's message, and so on. But if your spirit is, is rejoicing, get in line and rejoice. If you sense that your spirit is grieved about something, stop. Find out what it is that your spirit is grieved about. Maybe there's an environment that you're in and where there's a, some problems. Maybe your spirit is, is, is grieved or it's stirred because of, um, because he, maybe because he wants to draw you into an area of prayer. Sometimes you might hear you, you check and you recognize your spirit is, is, is praying, it's interceding. And you, you can hear some tongues going on the inside of you. Hey, don't ignore it. Get engaged with your spirit and begin to pray. Maybe excuse yourself for some folks. Go in the washroom. Go somewhere. Close the door. And just pray again to pray in the Holy Ghost. Somebody's life or deliverance might be on the line. Or maybe there might be something God might be wanting to say to you. Be sensitive to your spirit and obey the promptings of your spirit. Your spirit has the ability to perceive things. Perceive what's right. Perceive what's wrong. Perceive when people's motives are not what it appears to be. Don't ignore that. 
Recognize what the Spirit is perceiving and pay attention to it. Simply, don't ignore your spirit and its operation. By doing that, what will happen? First of all, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll be empowering your spirit and training your spirit, but you will also be renewing your mind and you will also be developing that sensitivity to your spirit that is necessary. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, it doesn't mean that you are... Uh, um, and, and, and be aware that your spirit knows things. Get that information from your spirit. I mean, someone comes to you um, with a prayer request or someone comes to you and tell you that, um, you, I don't know, that, 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 that their child is missing or something like that. I mean, you can emotionally react to that. But stop and check with your spirit. And you might check with your spirit and, you, and you're going to just sense that, you know what? It's okay. It's fine. The child is fine. And as a result, you'll be able to direct them, pray with them, agree with them from a totally different perspective. Instead of praying and speaking based on the circumstances, you'll be able to operate from the place of revelation. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying that you are to jump and run off with every, thing, every thought that crosses your mind. It says in Proverbs, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, that you are to prove all things. So check out your conclusions as well. Don't make sure they're consistent with the word of God, the spirit of God, the character of God, etc., etc. Amen? All right, number five. What else is there? Be live in a place where you are able to receive revelation. What do I mean by that? If you are a person where you're constantly agitated, you're always in strife, and, 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 and I mean, this is offending you, and that is offending you, and, and, and your mind is always buzzing, and there's all this stress, in that atmosphere, you're not going to get much revelation. In that atmosphere, it, it, certain th you just simply will not hear from the Spirit of God and be able to detect what's happening in your spirit and what your spirit might be saying. So what should you do? You need to develop a quietness on the inside. Isaiah 30 verse 15 says, In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Develop that. Practice that. The, 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 what, is, what does it say in First Peter chapter 3 and verse 4? That a, that, a, that, a, that a meek and a quiet spirit, how precious it is in the sight of God. Because God paid for it by the blood of Jesus. The price that was paid for you to have a quiet spirit was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So walk in that quietness of your spirit. Develop and maintain it in the name of Jesus. Don't allow yourself to be offended. Don't allow yourself to avoid strife by all means. Don't allow yourself to be agitated. No matter what's going on, no matter what storm is raging, you take time and sleep in the boat. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, number six. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here is a very interesting thing. Engage in spiritual word-based conversations and especially with believers that are of a like mind. Why is that? Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron. 2 Timothy 1 verse 14 says, That good thing which God has committed to you, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in you. Keep by the Holy Ghost that dwells in us, sorry. In other words, God has placed things in your life. But you keep it not just by what you do, but you keep it by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. In other words, I mean, when you have other believers of like mind and you're able to communicate and talk and share the things of God, it is as if what's on the inside of you multiplies. You go into an environment, you're the only Christian there, and it's a lo lot of family members, perhaps, and you're the only one that is born again. You sometimes might not have the, 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 the strength to testify to them about the goodness of God and the truth of the gospel. But let there be another person, another family member that is like-minded, that is also born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they have this same desire and mind to see the rest of that family saved. All of a sudden, you are able to witness with a greater boldness, whether it be in a workplace or wherever. Why? Because that gift that is in you, somehow or the other, you are able to keep multiplied by, 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 um, by the presence of God that is not only in you, but is in the other believers as well. I could tell you stories about that, but anyway, I'm going to move on for now. Malachi 3 verse 16. 
Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. And the Lord hearkened. God listened. And he heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before God, before him, for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Meditating is thinking on his name. Sharing with other believers, talking about him. And they say, God says there's a book of remembrance, and I record, I record. Yeah, they're talking about me. Hallelujah. Amen. Number seven, not, this is another th practice that you can have that would help, help your, your effectiveness in meditating and, 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 and getting revelation. You must continually pursue the revelation of righteousness. It never, why? Because righteousness is the sure foundation of every aspect of your Christian life. Romans 1 verse 16 and 17 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe, F to the Jew and to the Gentiles. And then it says why? Because therein, in that gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, from faith to faith, from one level to another level. The righteousness of God is revealed and move you from one level to another. Isaiah 54 verse 13 and 14 says, My children will be taught of the Lord. God says, My children, that you and I, will be taught of him by his spirit. And great will be their peace. And in righteousness they're going to be established. Why? Because of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. In righteousness they shall be established. And what's going to happen? They're going to be far from oppression. Why? Because they shall not fear. Now if the enemy does not have fear to work with, then he can't have access to your life. You will be far from oppression because they shall not fear. And from torment is not even going to come near them. And then it goes on to say in verse 17 of Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you should prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn it. Why? Because your righteousness is of God. Your authority is from him. The oneness is from him. The right standing is from him. Your rights, privileges, your sonship is all from him. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So continue to pursue the revelation of righteousness. It opens up the door to revelation knowledge. And it opens up the door to every aspect of your Christian life. And finally, be diligent to develop your relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He is the one that reveals. He is the one that brings all things to your remembrance. Jesus says in John 16 verse 13 that when he has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will take whatever belongs to me, Jesus said, and he will reveal it and unveil it unto you. Because all that the Father has is mine, and all that, I have, all, all that is mine is yours. That's why I say when the Holy Spirit has come, he's going to take what is mine and he will reveal it. He will unveil it unto you. He will bring you into the experience of it so that you can have fulfillment. He will not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. First John 2, 27 says, there is an anointing that abides in us. And that anointing teaches us all things. And even as he has taught you, you shall abide in him. So develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now all of this here that we've talked about today is about what? It's about biblical meditation. Biblical meditation. So that your mind could be renewed. So that you could become more sensitive to the operations of your born again spirit. What's happening in there. And that you can also begin to train your spirit so it could become more robust and more proficient in functioning in his various operations that God has imparted to him. Amen.